Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm glad to be back to see the Muslim new family. We're back with our series Snapchats from the Companions' Lives, Saeed ibn Zaid. And again, we're going to go over quickly why we're going through this, why we're talking about the Companions' Lives. Why is it so important for us to get to know them? Why is it so important for us to get to love them? Subhanallah, so the Prophet والسلام, tells us that on the Day of Judgment, we are going to be with those who we love. And if we love the right people, we're going to be in the right place. But if we love the wrong people, na'udhu billah min dhalik, uh, we're going to be in a very non-favorable place. And one of the best ways to love people is to actually get to know them. And to get to know them means to get to know their lives, mean, meaning to get to know who they were, what they acted like, what their personalities were. How can we be inspired by them? So we're going through the series, The Companions' Lives. We're learning about the companions in an effort to, inshallah, plant love in our hearts towards them and a love in our heart towards the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So may Allah... Uh, you know, so we could be with them on the day of judgment, inshallah, and in Jannah. So today we're talking about a very special Sahabi, someone who doesn't have a lot of a lot written about him actually, just because of how humble of a person and, and how much humility he had. Uh, it's Zaid ibn Zaid ibn, uh, ibn Amir ibn Nufayl, and he's one of the Ashra Mubashareen bil Jannah. He's one of the ten people who were promised paradise in the famous hadith by the Prophet. So as we always talk about, as we always start, we talk about their physical features. Like I said, there isn't a lot written about him. But what we know of him is that he was someone who was very tall, dark, and had a lot of hair. The main thing about him, actually, you'll see through this episode is that it's his humility. Um, he's someone who was very humble, someone who had a lot of humility, someone who played major roles and major, major parts in Islam early on and later on. But he was always someone in the background. He was the anonymous soldier the brave person whose face was covered in battle, but you did not know who he was, but he opened the way for other soldiers to come in, subhanAllah. And during his life, he basically did two things. He served Allah and led battles and fought in battles. And we're going to learn more about him, inshallah. So his family dynamic is very interesting because he was married to Fatima bint al-Khattab, who was the sister of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhum. His father was... Uh, uh, Zaid ibn uh, Amir who was who passed away before Islam and he's someone who is a big proponent for monotheism he he believed that there should only be one God and the Abrahamic God should be worshipped so he he was on the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, and he he promoted that in Mecca in his time but subhanallah he passed away before the prophet came and but before he passed away he made a dua he asked Allah that if one of his son, if his sons were to be alive in the days of the Prophet, that they would find the Prophet and that they would join him and they would be his companions. And subhanAllah, his dua and his prayer was accepted. So uh, Sa'id ibn Zaid was actually raised in a house that was very different from the homes normally uh, in that time in Mecca. It was a house filled with monotheism. There wasn't any idols. There weren't any Aslam. Um, it was all the worship of one God, the God of Abraham, alayhi salam. His early life, so when he was introduced to Islam, Islam wasn't something really strange to him. It wasn't something new to him. It was something that he actually gravitated towards really early on. And he was one of the earliest Muslims. Um, once he learned about Islam, once he learned about the Prophet ﷺ, he immediately said his shahad and he immediately became a Muslim. And he was married to Fatima bint al-Khattab and she also joined Islam. She was one of the early Muslims. And they had to keep their Islam secret actually early on. Because of uh, Fatima's brother, Umar ibn al-Khattab, before he became a Muslim, he was uh, a very adamant enemy of Islam, actually. And he basically tortured and uh, tried to persecute anyone who was Muslim, especially within his family. And there isn't a lot in the Sira, or there isn't a lot of uh, documentation about Fatima and her husband. But one of the famous stories, actually, one of the few stories that Fatima comes in is the story of Islam, Umar ibn al-Khattab. He was very angry one day and he was about to, he can kind of had it with Islam and he was about to go kill the Prophet ﷺ, or he wanted to do something bad. And then on his way to divert his attention, someone told him, go deal with the people of your house first. Go deal with the people of your home. Don't you know your sister is Muslim? So all of his anger gets directed to his sister. He goes to their house and there is Saeed ibn Zaid and Fatima and Khabab learning Quran and they're learning Quran at they're reciting Quran at the hand of Khabab. We're not gonna get into the story of Omar uh, radiallahu anhu because it's very well known the story of his Islam. Um 
Uh, but this, this, these are one of the few times that Fatima actually gets mentioned in uh, in the Sira and in, in, in the stories of the Sahaba. Uh, but basically, his Islam was immediate. He was one of the earliest converts, and he was one of the few. Uh, he was one of the Ashram Mashim Jannah, the ten who were promised Jannah. He kept his Islam secret until Umar ibn Khattab became Muslim, and after Umar ibn Khattab became Muslim, he really had no reason to keep his Islam. Uh, secret. He actually was one of the big proponents of Dawah in uh, Medina, in Mecca, because basically back in the day, your family backed you. And if you had a strong family, if you had someone like Umar ibn Khattab who was Muslim in your family, no one could touch you, no one could affect you. Uh, so subhanAllah, he was also, his family traveled with Umar ibn Khattab. They did the migration to Medina together. Uh, like I said, he was very much of an unknown soldier. So again, you're not going to find a lot of meat in the story today, but we're going to find a lot of uh, examples of his, his humility and how he chose to live his life. Like I said, he was one of the unknown soldiers. Um, uh, he loved obscurity. He loved humility. Um, let me see. Uh, so he, he was married to Fatima. And he was one of the people who were always at the forefront of battle. So when we talk about like the battle of opening Damascus, D- Damascus, for example, he was one of the first people there. He was one of the people at the forefront of the battle. He always said that he wanted to be one of the companions who always had his face covered, who he'd rather his face be covered in dirt and to be the unknown soldier than to be someone who was known in battle. Um, Subhanallah, and also we're gonna go. We're gonna go back a little bit to bed. Uh, we went to Damascus, and then we go to we go to bed. He was actually one of the two people who missed the Ghazwa Badr, him and Talha ibn Ubaid, because the Prophet ﷺ had sent him to be a scout to see what uh, the Qafil of Abu Sufyan did or was doing. And then when he came back to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ actually had set off uh, to go do the Ghazwa. But Subhanallah, because the Prophet ﷺ knew that the place that he had. Uh, the, the the value that he had uh, towards Muslims, uh, both Saeed and both Talha and Uthman and Affan were, were through the three people that the Prophet ﷺ actually put aside the spoils of war to them. And this is not about the spoils of war. It's not about giving them spoils. It's about actually giving them the, the honor of being the veterans of Badr. So they got the honorary uh, status of being veterans of Badr. Another thing is that another honor that he had was that he was also one of the scribes of the Qur'an. Uh, he was someone that the Prophet ﷺ would recite Qur'an to and he would write it down. And this is uh, an incredible honor to be one of the scribes of the Qur'an. Um, it's not just that any Sahabi would uh, would write down the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ would choose people to, to be uh, the those who uh, write down the Qur'an. And the Qur'an was written down on many things, whether it was uh, papers, whether it was pieces of bone or pieces of stone or rawhide. It was written down on many forms. So another part, like I said, he was one of the Ashram of Mashirim al Um, I mentioned his humility early on, but you'll see this truly manifest itself in this hadith. Whenever he recites the hadith of uh, the 10 people who were promised uh, paradise, he would name nine people and he would leave the 10th person out. He would leave himself out. And that's how humble he was, subhanAllah. He was very, he, he was very distinguished in the battle of, of, of the many battles, like the battle of, the, of your muq, of the opening of Dimashq. And and subhanAllah, when he when Dimashq was open, Umar ibn Khattab actually made him the wali of Dimashq, made him the emir of Dimashq. But he is not someone, but, uh, but Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Zayd was not someone who liked political positions. He's not someone who liked power. And within a few months, he wrote to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu that I do not want to be in this position. I don't like the lavishness of the palace. I don't like this way of life. This is not what I signed up for as an early Muslim. And indeed, he did leave uh, his position as the governor of uh, Dimashq. He always lived on the outlines. He was always someone in the background, someone who played a major role, but was always in the background, subhanAllah. Um, Even when the fitna broke out, he chose to not be a part of it. He chose to not choose sides. And he just decided to live in in the valleys outside of Medina. And he was not a part of it. So subhanAllah, there's a few lessons that we could learn from his life. Basically, the two main themes are his humility and uh, learning, identifying fitna and staying away from it. He never, he never fell for any of uh, sort of like the lavishness that was brought on after the Futuhat of Islam. All the wealth, all the palaces, all, all the, the different lifestyle, the, the Bedouins, the Prophet ﷺ and his Sahaba were not used to. 
So he stayed away from that. He was able to stay humble. He stayed away from like the front, the, the, the very forefront of battles. He was an important soldier, but he never really took on uh, uh, the admiration of people. And then when Fitna came, he stayed away from Fitna. He, uh, he, he decided to basically take no part of it, not even choose sides. And I think this is a very important lesson, especially in this world where we don't know what is right and wrong. And we're living in so many Fitnas right now. And it's so easy for us to make make uh, decisions and jump ahead and be like oh this is right this person's right this person's wrong and to make fast judgments uh it might be really good for us to to, to take lessons from Said and Zaid and to step back and try to take on the humility he had and stay away from fitna because that is one of the best ways to kind of protect ourselves now he passed away early on like late on he was one of the few the last three ashram Shunim and Jannah that lived on if i recall correctly uh, he passed away right after praying Fajr in a very peaceful manner. Uh, when the Sahaba brought him back to, to, to give him ghusl, and as the Sunnah it is to bathe someone in musk, they actually found that his body already smelled like musk, uh, an, and he was one of the people who narrated about 30 hadiths. Uh, anhu arda, may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, may Allah so allow us to love them and ijma'na ma'ahum yawm al-qiyamah, inshallah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My dear respected brothers and sisters. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا أكرم الأكرمين. اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واغفر لي ولوالدي إني تبت إليك وإني كنت من الظالمين. اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك لك الحمد سبحانك لا نحصي تنان عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Today إن شاء الله we continue with a series of how is the path to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and today we have an episode where I kind of collect some of the ideas that we've talked about previously and put them into action um, and today, I'm gonna, tr- um, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to talk about personal view. This is uh, very personal to me because this is how I think about the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala personally. This is how I think about my path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you could, to help me um, go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to help you go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to uh, help me, inshallah, deliver some of the ideas that I have and um, benefit you from these ideas, I mean, I mean, I mean. So one thing that we can greatly believe, uh, greatly uh, um, benefit from um, modern psychology is how it basically explains the concept of core beliefs. It's very simple, but it's used in psychology and psychotherapy to help people change who they are and change their behavior and fix some of the anxiety problems uh, they have. But here we're using it for the sake of understanding ourselves so that we fix ourselves. Um, core beliefs is something used in psychology and is very, very similar to the concept that the Prophet وسلم, called al qalb, where he, when he said, um, So the Prophet وسلم, says that there is something called al qalb, this thing drives all of our actions. And in psychology, in modern psychology, they, they have something called cold release. And they have very similar idea to the Prophet Sallallahu They say that it drives your behavior and your thoughts. These core beliefs that you build in yourself, they drive your behavior and your thoughts. So they say, if you want to fix yourself, fix your core beliefs and change them. And that's subhanAllah, very similar to the very, um, uh, uh, the very specific Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Salawat Rabbi wa Salamu Alayhi Where he explained it very explicitly The same exact way uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said that fix that heart And all of the behavior and the thoughts And the actions will be fixed inshallah ta'ala So today um, We want to talk about If we want to fix this core belief We first of all need to understand What our core beliefs are um, And I hope the idea of how core beliefs affect our behavior and thoughts is clear. But very basically, if 
you hear something, you see something, you, uh, you're told to do something. All of our actions and reactions are based on, um, are based on beliefs that we have built and acquired over time through childhood, then through people that we admire and respect and we take information from, and then through school, then to work, then to colleagues, then through environment, then, then all of these different factors come to ke- together to build these core beliefs in us. So if we want to fix ourselves, we need to understand what these core beliefs that we have and then know what we want to reach. And what we want to reach is defined by who? By who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallam, came to us. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to us to teach us how we should change our core beliefs to comply to what he subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. So today, I'm going to tell you something very personal, how I break or how I try to break my core beliefs to have better vision into how I want to fix myself and my path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me and to help you and benefit and help me to benefit you from this um, presentation, inshallah. So very basically, I try to ask myself, what are the questions that I had answered myself over time and had acquired answers to over time that create kinan, that define kinan, that define my actions, that drive my actions. And I broke them down to 15 different questions. There could be a lot more and they're so inter- interconnected and all that, but to gain a little bit of vision, I tried to break them down to 15 different questions. The first one is, what wins in decision-making? And, and we've talked about some of these before. We've talked about decision-making. We've talked about some of these, but let's, let's, let's review some of them. So the first one is what wins in decision-making? Is it my desire or is it my logic? The second one is who is trustworthy? And, if, and, and inshallah ta'ala, once I present all of these, we'll come back and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be. Each one of us will diagnose themselves differently for what their actual answers are for these questions. Because these answers drive our actions. So the first one is what wins in decision making? Is it logic or is it shahawat? Is it desire? The second one, who is, who is trustworthy to me? Who do I take? Who, who do I take information from and I, I, I follow and I take as, a, as, a, as an idol, as a, as a person that I can trust? And then who is who has the truth? And this basically just concludes of how much confidence do I have in this religion? Who is Allah to me? Who am I? Who, how do I view myself? What is success to me? What is defined as ultimate success? Who do I reach? How do I reach success? I know that success. I defined it. How do I reach it? Why should I endure pain? I endure pain all of my life. Different reasons, a lot of different places, a lot of different ways. Why do I endure? Why do? Why should I endure that pain? How do I look at that pain? Where to gain knowledge from? If I want to know something, if I want to get an answer, where do I get that answer from? What is the first thing that I go to uh, when I need answers about um, personal life? When I need answers about science, where do I get these? Where do I get my knowledge from? What is the trustworthy sources of knowledge that I have? What influences me and how? What are the factors that change, Kinan? These uh, I have questions now and presented in front of me. Now, what changes these questions? What are the factors that change me? So we're talking here about what my friends, um, my um, the social media that I expose myself to, all of the different things that affect Kinan's ideas and, and, and ideology. And how does it affect it? Feelings towards, what are the feelings that I have towards others? Towards my parents, towards the, the Muslims, towards the non-Muslims. What are the feelings that I have? All of these will drive my actions, right? Importance of opinion of others. What is the importance that I give to opinion of others? Um, how important is my, the opinion of my wife, my, my, my parents, my friends, my colleagues at work? How, which, if, if opinion of others contradict of between different people, who do I prefer? How much do I value opinion of others? 
how do I achieve physical comfort? What is the minimum that I need to do to achieve my physical comfort? What should Islam influence in my life? So I, if I believed in this religion, what should I imply it to? How much should I accept of it in my different aspects of life? And then lastly, what is my responsibility towards others? So when I analyzed my life, and you can do the same, and you can follow the, 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 uh, the methodology that I did or the, the questions that I asked myself, I found that these were the core beliefs that form Kinan, that he has built over time. And at the end, he reached to a state where he, his actions and his thoughts and all of everything that he does is built on answers to these questions. So what I had to do is sit down with myself and honestly ask myself, what are my real answers to these questions? And then honestly look for the answers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to have. So now I know the gap between where I am and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to be. So let's get some of the answers for some of these questions. What wins in decision making? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, very clearly, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَاهُ وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to follow ilm, wants us to follow logic, not emotions, not desire. That's the answer to the first question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have. Ala afala ya'qilun, afala yasma'un, using logic, using, uh, 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 looking for the truth. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. Who is trustworthy? Who is trustworthy? The most trustworthy is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As he asked the people around him, he said, uh, 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 he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told them if, if, if there was an army behind this valley, would you believe me that's about to invade you? Would you believe me? They said, yes, we never tried any um, lies on you. So who is the trustworthy person? Top, I should have it as Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second, the scholars of Islam, right? Who has the truth? Islam. Islam has the truth. And the more confidence I have in this religion, the more confidence that I have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the Prophet وسلم, and, and, the, and the risala they came with, uh, the stronger I am. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is, that is what, why Quran came. That is why the Prophet وسلم, came. There's so much to be said there. And it's a very deep concept that we keep building and building, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says and clearly warns us, So we try as much as possible to learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who am I? Who am I? I'm a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should believe that we're servants, really, ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every all the na'am that we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we want to reach to. And we are so weak without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are so weak without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us abilities, but these abilities not from us, not because we are smart, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them to us. What is success? Success is um, those who were taken away and saved from hellfire and put in Jannah, those are people, those are the ones who succeeded. So this is what success should be to me. How do I reach success? by worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by following everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had asked me to do as much as possible. That's how I reach that success. Why should I endure pain? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I won't reach that success without pain. He defined it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had explained to me exactly why I should be enduring pain. Where to gain knowledge from? The Prophet Sallallahu says um, that he left two things with us. That he, we, he left two things with us. If we follow, we will never go astray. The Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah, right? So this is the first source of knowledge that I go to. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa says, مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained to us everything how to live our life in the Quran. Now there's other knowledge, other types of knowledge that specialized people could have. But the source, the real source of knowledge comes from 
the Quran and the Sunnah. What influences me and how? I need to look at my friends, how they influence me. Social media and the media that I expose myself to. Uh, I need to make sure that I follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's order where he says, uh, they are, they step away and they guide themselves away from level, which is uh, um, unuseful um, um, matters and, and, and uh, th- that drive nowhere. Then feelings towards others. How do I feel towards non-Muslims? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to feel, to treat them with birr and ihsan. But at the same time, not to indulge my religion into the religion and mix them up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to feel good towards Muslims, other Muslims. They want, he wants me to feel like I'm a one nation with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to feel very good towards my parents. So what are the feelings that I have towards the people around me? These feelings drive a lot of our actions. So we need to look into them and we need to make sure that they comply with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's orders. What is the importance of, of the opinion of others? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the Quran, ومن الناس من يقول آمنا بالله فإذا أوذي في الله جعل فتنة الناس كعذاب الله. And there's of of people who say we believe in Allah subhanahu wa taala, and if they're tested by by others, by the influence of, of others, by the opinion of others, they make the influence and the and the and the uh, uh, tests that Allah subhanahu wa taala had put them through. Um, by the influence of others, the same as uh, uh, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we want to make sure that we make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala superior to all the, the opinion of others. Um, how to achieve physical comfort? That's a very important question. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to live comfortly, but without israf? What should, what should Islam influence? How much should I comply to Islam in my life? Should, should, what are the aspects in my life that Islam should comply that my life should comply to Islam with um, responsibility towards others, responsibility towards other Muslims. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Woman ahsan qawla min man da'a ila Allah wa amila salihan wa qala inna ni min al-Muslimin." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants me to deliver this message to others. So these questions, and there's so much more. I just gave some quick examples of what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to do and wants us how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to answer these questions. So. The way we want to approach fixing ourselves is looking at what affects each one of us, break it down and look at the answers that we have right now for ourselves and the answers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to have for ourselves and try to change ourselves to be, to, uh, to be in the state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be in. So that's very quickly how to use a modern um, methodology, which is the core beliefs and uh, uh, that modern psychology has talked about in fixing ourselves and understanding uh, the concept of fixing the qalb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yufiqana wa iyaakum ima yuhibu wa yarda wa asalallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala an yurina al-haqqa haqqan wa yurzuqna atiba'ah wa yurina al-batila batila wa yurzuqna ashtinaabah See you in the next episode, inshallah ta'ala wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومواله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي uh, Not too long ago I came across uh, you know study done by the famous Kuwaiti uh, social scientist and uh, journalist and da'i, uh, Dr. Jasim Al-Mutawwi, uh, where he uh, uh, zoomed in on uh, the uh, imminent dangers that are threatening our youth in the next 20 years. And after looking at his conclusion, I uh, couldn't agree uh, 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 more Uh, with what he uh, uh, came to uh, uh, find, that there are three uh, dangers that our youth are subjected to, the first one being the uh, quick spread of atheism, uh, loss of religious identity. The second one is uh, basically the acceptance of Uh, sexual uh, deviant behaviors 
and I have to be discreet here, uh, there are certain uh, sexual choices that uh, now uh, there are even Muslims who are uh, claiming that as long as this act is done between two uh, consenting adults, why should we worry about that? Even this is where the danger lies, even if just by us becoming neutral. And the third eminent danger is the spread of uh, uh, abuse of illicit drugs. These three dangers uh, are uh, facing our youth. And today I want to look at the first one, and that is the exponential increase in the rate of uh, uh, atheism. Uh, the children, the youth, young people, uh, you know, losing their religious identity. And just to put this in statistical perspective, uh, there was a study uh, done throughout North America whereby they found that 28% of youth of different religious backgrounds not Muslim, but different religious backgrounds, uh, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, 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 Sabians, uh, secularists, humanists, and Muslims, 28% uh, of them throughout North America do not anymore uh, associate with a religious identity. Uh, and these are youth between the ages of 18 and 28. Now, uh, when uh, they looked at each group separately, at each religious at each religious group separately, they found that for Muslims, the uh, percentage is not far off from the average of all religious traditions, uh, whereas the general percentage is 28% among Muslims. Listen to this, and that's what really should alert us and raise the red flag. Among Muslims, this is 23%, not very far from the 28%. And that means that one quarter of our youth between the ages of 18 and 28 do not anymore associate with the faith they were born with. And are we going to just keep going and deal with this, uh, uh, you know, by saying, well, you know, uh, what can we do or uh, deal with it in the classical outdated strategies or lack thereof, because there's no strategy that I know of that is really paying attention to this. If left to, uh, 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 you know, just grow, it will grow exponentially. And come 20 years from now, we will be lamenting that, uh, you know, our youth may not associate themselves with their deen anymore. And let us not forget the hadith that is narrated through the authority of Abu Huraira and found in Sahih Muslim and in Sunan At-Tirmidhi, whereby Rasulullah is reported to have said, Badiru bil a'mal salihah fitanan ka qita'il layl al-muzlim yusbihu al-rajul fiha mu'minan wa yumsi kafiran aw yumsi كافرا ويصبح مؤمنا يبيع أحدهم دينه بعرض من الدنيا قليل uh, uh, you know quick uh, uh, be quick to do as much of good deeds as possible to avert the eminent possibility of seditions hardships difficulties that will come upon the Muslim community uh, like pieces of darkness in the middle of the night, wherein you will find someone waking up as a believer and ending the day as a non-believer or starting the night as 
uh, believer and ending in the morning as a non-believer. A person is prepared to give up his or her deen in exchange for a cheap material gain of this dunya. Now, let me just ask us, don't you feel that this warning is upon us? Aren't we seeing people who we thought are icons of faith uh, who are changing overnight, uh, changing their statements, uh, uh, appearing to have lost part of their faith, their iman? We are seeing this all over the world. And this is a glo global phenomenon we have to be very careful about. Now, uh, because of time, I want to say that this is a real problem. And, uh, uh, you know, we have to ask ourselves, so what's the solution? I uh, did some research and I looked at different studies and the conclusions, the things that I put together uh, pointed that there are four things that affect the religious identity of our children, all children. And these four, if we take care of them, they may stop this disease from spreading. I know, I know brothers, sisters, friends, families, uh, that there are people now standing in long lineups at uh, uh, booster vaccination clinics because they are afraid of the virus that's upon us. Uh, uh, let us realize, as I mentioned last week, that God willing, this virus, the Omicron, is going to eat itself up. And today I read uh, uh, you know, a study of a Jordanian doctor who made all the sense that you know, uh, this herd immunity, if left to spread. And by the way, by the end of January, most of the people in the world would have caught this Omicron virus because it's so infective. If we stop scaring the people about it and let it just spread, because it is not that dangerous, it will build immunity inside us and it will eat itself and it will be gone. However, the virus of losing one's religious identity may not be easy to stop unless we pay attention to four elements. Number one, family. Number two, peers, friends that our children will take. Number three, social institutions. And number four, social media iPads, telephones, uh, computers. We have to pay attention to these things. Now, uh, uh, let me start with the factor among these four that studies show is of utmost, utmost. It's, it's right here if we consider family to be uh, an influencer of religious identity, then we have to place the family here, and then the peers will go as a distant second, and then uh, social institutions after that, and social media after this. So family, it is in our hands, brothers and sisters, parents, prospective parents, young parents who still uh, uh, don't have children yet, or whose children are still young, Please don't lose time. It's a big responsibility. You know, studies show that uh, among uh, teenagers, and these are from the ages of 13 to 19, studies show that 34% of Muslim teenagers speak to their parents about Islam, about deen, twice a week or even more than that. That's great, 34%. Now, 28% of them speak to their parents once a month. That is if they speak at all. And 38% do not speak to their parents. They avoid speaking to their parents about Dean. They don't like to engage in such an unpleasant discussion with their parents. Now that means 66% of our children 
do not really want to talk with their parents about Islam. And that is a problem. We have to open our eyes because, you know, children, teenagers went on to say that the reason they don't like to discuss Islam with their parents is that their parents always always like to dictate. They cut their children off. They are not prepared to listen. They lecture. They uh, uh, get so upset if the children, if those teenagers sound, uh, um, you know, um, dismissive. Uh, if they don't agree with what their parents say, uh, uh, parents get very upset and they tell them that they are wrong. Parents are always right. Now, please, brothers and sisters, please, parents, let me, as a parent who graduated from my parenting school, six children, and, you know, through experience, you know, at times, I knew when we sat to talk about Dean, and we continue to talk about this, even though now uh, most of my children, you know, five of them are married except one, uh, uh, you know, uh, we still talk about Dean. Why? Uh, when they say something that I may disagree with, I let them say it. And when I respond, I respond indirectly in a way that they have the answer embedded in my statement and they get it but do not tell your children with a frown on your face that you are wrong. How dare you say that there's nothing wrong in prom, in dating, as long as obviously our generation may get upset about that because we are not used to it. But please, I advise you, especially those parents living in Canada, in the States, that this is not the way to deal with your children. And another thing I want to say, since we are talking about families, that the studies show that most influencer among families are those families that are homogeneous, where the father and the mother have grown to uh, deal with issues together. Uh, uh, children feel that they are uh, uh, one and the same. Uh, uh, they don't see them fight with each other. They don't see them disagree in such a way that the discussion uh, becomes an argument and becomes a fight. You know, these are the parents that influence their children the most. Now, less after that, are uh, uh, single uh, parent families. And less after that are those, uh, 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 those families of divorced parents where the parents live in different homes and the children are shipped between both uh, uh, homes, both houses, and the children are so confused and least effective, if not, uh, uh, zero effective or even at the negative side of measures is for interreligious families where the mother continues to be a non-Muslim and the children find themselves lost. Is it Christmas or is it Eid? Is it circumcision or is it no circumcision? Is it this or that as far as those things where there's disagreement in the practices and the principled behavior associated with the dean. We have to pay attention. I receive couples who come asking to be married and the uh, bride is not a Muslim. She is from the people of the book. And I sit and I warn them and I tell them, you know, you come to me after three months and, you know, I have to speak to you. And if you don't like it, you know, I feel that I don't want to be an element to bring something that is not going to be positive. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, be careful. You know, don't let infatuation and physical attraction dictate how you will live the next 50, 60, 70 years of your life. That is, if you continue to live together, most of the time, if you don't agree on those religious differences, 
then it is a ticket to disastrous outcome. Uh, you know, quickly, I have to say, I know the time is running out. Uh, you have to help your children in finding the peers that are going to help them uh, uh, enjoy Islam. And, uh, uh, you know, don't be uh, among those mentioned in Surah Al-Furqan. يَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَا uh, 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 يَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي uh, uh, لم أتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد أضلني عن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للإنسان خذولا uh, uh, you know this is described in سورة الفرقان that imagine this description of you know biting on both hands of a person on the day of judgment saying I wish I did not partook such a person as a friend because he she swayed me from the straight path and let shaitan dictate how I live my life we don't want to be among those friends are extremely important now social institutions we live you know in families where parents now will pay everything for their son or daughter to become a doctor a lawyer uh, to become an engineer, uh, but they don't pay that much attention to give them the Islamic education. If it is costly, parents are not prepared to do that. You know, institutions now are such that are influencing our choices for their for our children. And finally, social media. You know, many parents now, in order to appease their children, they buy them this beast and they put it in their hands. And the children as young as two years of age, they just go and some of them now they cannot live without it. They go to the washroom with it. They 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 go to sleep with it. They and you don't. No, I shouldn't say you don't know what they see because you do know. You do know those pop-ups that come on those phones, on the iPads, on computers. And we think that we've done lots of good to our children. So these are the things that sway them away from Dean, uh, uh, social institution, peers, and above all, families. So at least we as families, as parents, can do something about it to stop this progress this scary progress of atheism. Next week, inshallah, I'm going to talk about a recipe to deal with the, the other two circles of eminent danger, sexual deviance as well as abuse of illicit drugs, how we can deal with them together with one thing that is prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is our creator. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children and our future. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi. Ati fikran jadida uhadithkum fiha an al-bunyawiyya. Al-bunyawiyya manhaj naqdi hadith wa aydan muathir fi ma ba'da al-hadatha muhtas bal naqd al-adabi. Tahadathna sabiqan an al-wujudiyya wa an al-tarikhaniyya. Al-tarikhaniyya kama qulna hiya manhaj naqdi يحاول دائما التركيز على التاريخ وأثره على إنتاج النص وإنتاج الأفكار ثم أيضا اقتبسوا هذا المنهج لتفسير القرآن الكريم وبعضهم من خلال هذا المنهج بدأ يدرس القرآن الكريم كما يدرس النص الأدبي وكأنه إنتاج لبيئة ما بيئة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في مكة المكرمة في القرن السابع الميلادي الآن نكمل الحديث أيضا عن مناهج النقد الأدبي والتي اقتبست أيضا لتفسير وتأويل القرآن الكريم وقبل أن أحدثكم عن البنيوية نأخذ فكرة عامة عن بعض مناهج النقد الأدبي هناك مناهج قديمة من أيام اليونان كما نعرف أرسطو كان من المهتمين بالنقد الأدبي كان لديه كتابات عن البلاغة والخطابة ويسمى منهجه بمنهج المحاكاة ثم هناك مناهج حديثة اقتبست من علم النفس ومن السياق التاريخي والسياق الاجتماعي مناهج تحاول فهم النصوص من خلال سياقها العام بعدها جاءت المناهج الحداثية وعلى رأسها البنيوية والتي سنتحدث عنها بشكل مفصل أكثر وهي كانت مقدمة لما بعد الحداثة والتي من أشهر مناهجها التفكيكية وبالمناسبة بعض الباحثين والنقاد قد يستخدمون أكثر من منهج في دراسة واحدة وفي دراسة نص أدبي واحد وربما يصعب عليك حتى لو كنت متمرسا اكتشاف المنهج الذي يمارسه أحد النقاد في دراسة أحد النصوص أو أحد الكتب يعتقد أن بداية ظهور البنيوية كانت مع بداية ظهور علم النفس التجريبي 
الذي ظهر تقريبا في عام 1879 على يد ويليام فونت الذي كان هو أول من أسس مختبرا أو معملا لعلم النفس هنا يعتبر أنه علم النفس انفصل عن الفلسفة وبدأ يدرس بشكل تجريبي وعلمي بنفس الوقت هنا ربما البعض يقول أنه المنهج البنيوي بدأ يظهر في العلوم الإنسانية ومنها أيضا النقد الأدبي وسميت بنيوية لأنها اهتمت بوصف البناء التركيب الإنساني ويقال أيضا لدى البعض أن تأثرها كان من علم الكيمياء الذي اهتم بدراسة بنية المواد وبنية الذرة ومكونات الذرة لاحقا لكن بداية ظهور البنيوية كانت على يد السويسري دي سوسير الذي توفي في عام 1913 والطريف أن العلم هذا أو هذا المنهج لم يشتهر ولم ينتشر إلا بعد وفاته ببضع سنوات لما طلابه نشروا كتابه محاضرات في اللسانيات العامة فيعتقد أيضا أن دي سوسير هو مؤسس علم اللسانيات وفقه اللغة الجديد وهو كان أيضا في نفس الوقت الذي أسس فيه فونت أول مختبر لعلم النفس بنفس الوقت وكان قد بدأ بدراسة الفيزياء لكنها لم تعجبه فانتقل وربما بخلفية فيزيائية إلى دراسة اللغويات الحديثة الإنجاز الأكبر الذي ينسب إلى ديسوسير هو أنه درس اللغات بصفتها بنية مستقلة بمعزل عن التاريخ وعن تطور المجتمع الذي نشأت وتطورت فيه هذه اللغات كان يعني يمسك كل لغة ويدرسها بشكل مستقل تماما عن بيئتها كان يقول أن اللغة عبارة عن نظام أو نسق من العلامات المترابطة فيما بينها ودلالة كل علامة لا تأتي منها هي نفسها ليست مستقلة بذاتها وإنما من علاقتها بالبنية العامة وبالعلامات الأخرى التي تشكل بنية هذا النص أيضا بنفس الوقت في الربع الأول من القرن العشرين بدأت تظهر ما تسمى بمدرسة الشكلانية في روسيا والتي كانت تهتم بالشكل الخارجي للغة فكانت تدرس النص باستقلال تام عن المؤلف وعن سياق النشأة التي نشأ فيها المؤلف وخلفيته وثقافته والتراكم الثقافي الذي أثر عليه والظروف البيئية التي أنتج فيها هذا النص هذا كله بالنسبة لهم ليس مهما يهمهم فقط شكل هذا النص سواء كان قطعة أدبية وحتى لما نطبقه على النصوص المقدسة فبنفس الطريقة في منتصف القرن العشرين بدأت البنيوية بالانحسار بسرعة عجيبة وتحديدا في فرنسا مع أنها نشأت فيها غالبا الضربة الأولى كانت تقريبا على يد نوم تشومسكي في أواخر الخمسينات مع تأسيسه نظرية القواعد التحويلية أو التوليدية ثم على يد ما بعد الحداثيين وعلى رأسهم داريدا وفوكو وبداية ولادة الحفريات والتفكيكية والتي تحدثنا عن شيء منها في حلقة سابقة وأيضا مع انتشار السرد الروائي وهذا الجنس الأدبي المسمى بالرواية في القرن العشرين أكثر من الأدب السابق اللي كان يركز أكثر على الشعر أيضا الرواية نفسها نمطها لا يتلاقى كثيرا مع البنيوية لا يمكنك أن تدرس رواية كاملة بناء فقط على الدراسة البنيوية التي تأخذها بشكل مستقل عن بيئتها وعن كاتبها وعن البيئة التي كتب فيها الكاتب هذه الرواية ولا ننسى هنا الحديث عن الناقد الفرنسي رولان بارت الذي تأثر بالشكلانية الروسية ولكن أخذها إلى أقصى مراحل التطرف وأعلن موت المؤلف بمعنى هو يأخذ النص أيا كان جنسه أو شكله ويعتبر أن المؤلف غير موجود وكأن هذا النص قد ولد لوحده في الطبيعة فيدرسه بشكل مستقل تماما بحيث لا يهمه أبدا ما اسم المؤلف وما طبيعته وما ثقافته ولماذا ألف هذا النص وكيف ألفه بماذا تأثر هذا كله لا يهمه يهمه فقط هذا النص كيف يستطيع هو كقارئ وكناقد أن يقرأه ويولد منه المعاني هنا بدأت تظهر ما بعد الحداثة والتفكيكية من رحم البنيوية بحيث صار النص مستقل تماما وقادر على توليد معاني لا نهائية وربما الكثير من هذه المعاني التي يستنتجها القارئ أو الناقد لم يكن يقصدها الكاتب أصلا طيب نلخص الآن أهم مبادئ البنيوية أولا الاستغناء التام عن المناهج التفسيرية السابقة وحتى التي كانت تمارس في نفس وقت ظهور البنيوية فلست بحاجة لقراءة التاريخ ولا نفسية الكاتب ولا معرفة شخصيته ولا آدابه ولا أفكاره ولا حتى هويته ثانيا الاهتمام بدراسة النص أولا ثم النظريات الاجتماعية ورفع شعار النص ولا شيء غير النص ثالثا التعامل مع النص على أنه بنية مستقلة ثم تقسيمه أيضا إلى بنى فرعية مستقلة كل واحدة مستقلة عن الأخرى هناك بنية معجمية بنية صوتية بنية نحوية بنية إملائية وكل واحدة منها تدرسها بشكل مستقل ثم تدرس البنية بشكل عام لهذا النص البنيوية ظهرت كما يقال في القرن العشرين للرد على بعض المذاهب السابقة مثل الماركسية 
والطريف كما قلنا أنها انتهت في منتصف القرن العشرين ثم بدأت تنتقل إلى العالم العربي واستوردت لدراسة النصوص المقدسة وعلى رأسها القرآن الكريم بعدما كانت قد تلاشت تقريبا من العالم الغربي ولما نريد أن يتوسع في فهم البنيوية ثم التفكيكية فأنصح بكتاب عبد العزيز حمودة الذي طبع في سلسلة عالم الفكر المرايا المحدبة من البنيوي إلى التفكيك المطبوع عام 1998 لذلك قبل أن أحدثكم عن تأثير البنيوية فيما يسمى بالقراءات المعاصرة لفهم القرآن الكريم أشير إلى بعض الأمثلة لمحاولة تأويل وفهم القرآن والتاريخ والتراث من منظور ماركسي أيضا فمن أهم من كتب بهذا المجال محمد عيتاني في كتابه الصادم القرآن في ضوء الفكر المادي الجدلي أيضا حسين مروة الذي حاول أن يدرس التراث بنظرة ماركسية حسن حنفي الذي كان قد أبدع ما سماه باليسار الإسلامي طيب تيزيني أيضا في محاولاته صادق جلال العظم أنه كان ملحدا ولا يؤمن بالقرآن كله فهناك عدة محاولات كانت تحاول أن تدرس القرآن أو التراث بشكل عام سواء آمنت به على أنه منزل من الله أو شيء آخر ولكن من نظرة مادية جدلية من خلال صراع الطبقات واعتبار العالم كله عبارة عن صراع بين الفقراء والأغنياء على المادة والمال والاقتصاد فقط لاحقا ظهرت البنيوية لدينا كما قلنا بعد أن انحصرت من فرنسا وأوروبا بدأت تظهر عندنا في السبعينات محاولة قراءة معاصرة كما سميت جديدة لتوليد معاني وقراءات وفهوم جديدة للقرآن الكريم وغالبا تكون مدفوعة بدوافع نفسية إما للحاق بالغرب على اعتبار وكأن من يدرس النصوص أيا كانت بمنظور ماركسي مادي جدلي بنيوي تفكيكي وكأن هذا هو الذي دفع الغرب إلى التقدم وصناعة الطائرات وغزو الفضاء هذا غالبا ما يقوله أمثال محمد أركون وغيرهم النقطة الجوهرية التي يحاولون التبرير فيها هي أن القرآن هذا يجب أن يكون مولدا لمعاني جديدة وكأننا نحن يعني جربنا كل المعاني السابقة التراثية الأرثوذكسية كما يسميها أركون ودعونا الآن نجرب مناهج جديدة وفهوم جديدة لعلها تنقلنا إلى عالم آخر وحضارة أخرى وبذلك يصبح المفسر والمؤول والباحث والناقد لهذا النص قادرا على تطبيق كل هواه الشخصي وميوله واندفاعاته وتأثراته ربما بالغرب نفسه لإنتاج قراءة مختلفة تماما من هذا القرآن دون أي اعتبار لمقصد الشارع دون أي اعتبار لما يريده الله جل وعلا عندما أنزل هذا القرآن ليرشد الناس ويهديهم إلى ما يريده منهم فتصل بذلك إلى فكرة مبدئية هي لماذا إذا أنزل لنا هذا النص إذا كان قادرا على التوليد لمعاني لا نهائية وقد تكون متعارضة فما الحاجة إذا لهذا النص إذا كنا نفكر بهذه الطريقة لنترك النص جانبا ونترك الإسلام كله جانبا ما عاد أي قيمة بهذه الحالة الطريف أن محمد أركون لم يقدم نموذجا حسب معلوماتي متكاملا لما كان يدعو له مثلا كان في السبعينات يدعو للبنيوية مع أنها كما قلنا انتهت في الستينات في أوروبا ثم في أواخر الثمانينات والتسعينات إلى أن مات صار يدعو إلى التفكيكية والألسونية الحديثة والسيميائية وما كان يقدم أمثلة عملية لنرى كيف ستطبق هذه المناهج على القرآن أو التراث بشكل عام وكيف ستؤدي إلى النقلة الحضارية فعلا التي يطمح لها ونطمح نحن معه أيضا لها مثلا في أكثر من كتاب له يقول كما حدث في أوروبا بقراءة ألسونية حديثة للتوراة والإنجيل فيجب أن نقرأ القرآن بنفس الطريقة ويقول أيضا أركون في أحد نصوصه على المنهج الألسن الحديث بالرغم من غلاظته وثقل أسلوبه لكنه سيخلصنا إذا استعملناه في القرآن الكريم من تلك الحساسية النقدية التي تربطنا سيكولوجيا بهذا النص يعني تخلصنا من تقديسنا لهذا النص القرآني باعتباره منزل من عند الله بهذا المعنى أنت تتخلص من أي تبعات لا تشعر بأي عذاب ضمير إذا خرجت بنتيجة أن آيات الحجاب مثلا لها معنى معارض تماما كما فعل محمد شحرور أو لتغير كل الآيات المتعلقة بتوزيع الميراث والجهاد وكل ما يتعلق بالأنظمة السياسية والاقتصادية والعسكرية كلها تغيرها بما يوافق الحياة الغربية تحديدا وهنا نعود للسؤال الأول لماذا نسمى مسلمين إذن تخلى عن كل هذا الإسلام وابتكر دينا جديدا ولا ترتبط بهذا القرآن بدلا من تشويهه بهذه الطريقة وحتى لا تتهموني بأني أبالغ في اتهام أركون هو نفسه يقول أن التفسير يجب أن يمر بثلاثة مراحل مرحلة الدراسة الألسونية ثم مرحلة التعرف على البنية الأسطورية للقرآن وهذه مصطلحاته المعروفة ثم إعادة تقويم التراث التفسيري للقرآن الكريم هذه كلماته هو طيب قد يقال هل البنيوية بشكل عام خاطئة تماما؟ نحن لا نقول هذا بالضبط 
فمثلا بعض البنيويين تمسكوا بنظرية النظم للجرجاني في كتابه دلائل الإعجاز وهذا صحيح إلى حد ما وأيضا هناك منهج للتفسير يسمى تفسير القرآن بالقرآن ومن أهم الأمثلة لذلك كتاب أضواء البيان للشيخ محمد أمين الشنقيطي رحمه الله فلا ننكر أنه يمكنك أن تدرس القرآن وتفهمه كبنية مستقلة ولكن ليس بالمعنى المتطرف الذي يقصي المصدر وهو الوحي وأسباب النزول ولماذا نزل؟ ولماذا نزلت تحديدا كل آية؟ وما الذي كان يقصده النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عندما كان يقول لهم الآية نزلت هنا وفي هذا الحدث ورتب مكانها في القرآن الكريم بهذا المكان وهذا ما كان يفعله الصحابة عندما يحاولون تفسير بعض الآيات وكانوا يتناقلون أسباب النزول وحتى بعد وفاة النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام كان بعضهم يستشهد بأنه كان يعرف لماذا نزلت هذه الآية وفي أي سياق رويت فلا تبتر الآية عن سياقها لا عن سياق سبب النزول ولا عن المعنى اللغوي الذي نزلت له وإلا فيمكنك أن تفهمها بطريقة مختلفة تماما وقد تكون معارضة لما كان ينص عليه الشارع إذا في الختام كما حدثتكم في حلقة سابقة عن الوجودية التي تحاول إقصاء الله جل وعلا عن تفسير الوجود وتعطي الإنسان هذا الدور المركزي أصلا هو الذي يحدد هدف وجوده كله من خلال حريته مطلقة البنيوية تقريبا تصل إلى نفس النتيجة حتى لو لم تكن تنكر وجود الله فهي لا تنص على الإلحاد لكنها عند تفسير النص وتفسير الوحي تكاد تتعامل معه على أنه قد نشأ لوحده أو ليس هناك داعي للإيمان بوجود الله أو لما يريده الله عندما نفهم هذا النص فالنتيجة تقريبا واحدة وهكذا لا اعتبار في التفسير إلا لما هو مشاهد ومحسوس يمكن أن تشاهده وتمسكه وتتعامل معه بشكل مجرد وتطلق الأحكام عليه وتستنبط منه ما تشاء هنا نصل إلى نهاية هذه الوجبة الفكرية أرجو أن تكون مفيدة لكم لا تنسوا متابعة الحلقات السابقة ومشاهدة ما سيأتي إن شاء الله في وجبات مقبلة وأن تشاركوا هذه الفيديوهات لتصل إلى أكبر عدد من الناس والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Moran Abdurabbo. I'm a third year student at Queen's University. Welcome back to, I think, the fifth episode now of my program on this season of Muslim Do. Honored to be here today and I'd like to thank the great team behind this app and of course Dr. Amjad for their efforts and dedication. About a week ago, I was sitting, chilling, whatever, with a group of people right here in Canada, but we were all of Arab origins and I was Egyptian. There were a bunch of Palestinians, some from Jordan, some from Iraq, and I think pretty sure one from Tunisia. And we were just there talking about a whole bunch of things. And then, uh, you know, our conversation slips into talking about the recent FIFA Arab Cup, which Algeria won. And then this leads to this whole other big argument between some Jordanian guys in the group and some of the Iraqi guys on which country is better. And this one's saying this one's better than this one, whatever. And why the other people of the other country just suck in every possible way. And it was insane. It, you know, it got really heated. And I was just sitting there watching it all. On the spot, I knew very well this wasn't the first time I saw something like this. I follow a whole bunch of Arab news sites uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And on any story, you can just look at the comment section. You'll always find a fight between a Moroccan and an Algerian or between an Egyptian and a Saudi. There's such a high amount of ego and uh, pride and nationalism in those fights. It's insane. We see it happen a lot, very frequently. And by the way, many friendships, many good relationships were lost because of them arguments like this. And it pains me. It pains me to see it. Because if only those people knew and fully understand how those countries they're so apocalyptically obsessed with, how they were formed, how they came to be, they would also begin to realize how dumb this whole thing is and how useless this ultra-nationalism they're holding is. On the screen right here, you can see the modern borders of the Arab world, barring some territorial disputes. I won't talk about those today. Okay, so how were those borders formed? Well, today I'm going to talk about exactly that. I'm going to focus more specifically on the Asian side of the Arab world, just for the sake of time and for, you know, simplicity. But I assure you 100%, I assure you very well, that the same applies to North Africa mm -hmm. and to the Southern Arabian Peninsula, all the places in the Arab world, the same concept applies. So don't get it twisted. The Asian side of the Arab world was mostly controlled by the Ottoman Empire, as you can see on this map. Now, it's important to note one thing. The Ottoman Empire was not the big fancy muscles empire it once was. Back in the 14th and 15th century, the Ottoman Empire was a nemesis to European powers. And it held a whole lot more territory than you can see. But 
the empire had now become so weak, it was called the sick man of Europe. And the European powers knew the empire was sort of approaching its end. And they were eager to divide it up once, once, uh, once that happened. And the critical point in the story is the beginning of the First World War in 1914. As you may know, the First World War was fought between the Triple Entente on one side, who were Britain, France, and Russia, and then the Central Powers on the other side. This was mainly the German Empire and Austria-Hungary. Now, the Ottoman political circles were sort of conflicted on which side to join. So they had a decent relationship with, with the British and the French, but they all, and, and they hated the Russians. That was one thing. They really hated the Russians, and they wanted to take back some of the land that they lost to the Russians during uh, the, Russo -Japan, the Russo Ottoman War. And then they had a really good relationship with Germany, who was in the Central Powers, but they also hated the Habsburgs, who were in Austria Hungary. And there was a long time rivalry over the centuries between the Ottoman dynasty and the Habsburgs. In fact, Austria had actually just annexed Bosnia from the Ottoman Empire. Eventually, and this is, by the way, an oversimplification, but what happened is basically the pro-German factions in the Ottoman government, led by the Minister of War, Enver Pasha, went ahead and shelled a bunch of Russian coastal cities in the Black Sea. And now the Ottomans were, they were now forced, or basically they now joined the war uh, with the central powers against the Entente. Almost right away, Britain, France, and Russia began to look into how the Ottoman territories were going to be divided uh, up after the Ottoman Empire was defeated. At first, Britain and Russia signed what's called the Treaty of Constantinople. And this was in 1915. In the treaty, it was agreed that Russia would get Constantinople, so the left part of the green here, and Eastern Anatolia, which is the right green part as you can see on the map. Both those territories were extremely important to Russia. And by the way, it's important to give credit. All the maps used from here on onwards uh, are used from a video by this YouTube channel, Simple History. They made a really good video on this topic. I recommend you watch it. Once again, the channel's called, my bad, it's not called uh, Simple History, that's a different channel. The channel's called History Matters. Okay? The channel's called History Matters, that was a mistake. Anyways, and then in the same year, another treaty called the Treaty of London was signed and it gave Italy those lands in southern Anatolia, marked with uh, the light green. One second. There we go. The light green part in southern Anatolia. Now, the Britain, the, you know, Britain then wanted uh, another front to be opened against the Ottomans in the war. So what they did is that they offered the ruler or the Sharif, the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein bin Ali, his own empire, if he revolted against the Ottomans. And that was to keep them busy. It would be called the Kingdom of Arabia. So uh, that started the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire, and it you know, proved very detrimental to their war effort. According to this pact, Britain would also get a, a small colony in Mesopotamia, right where the city of Basra is in modern Iraq. But there was actually a problem. You see the French, who were also fighting the Ottomans across the Mediterranean, but also in Mesopotamia, they also felt it was unfair for the British to gain land, but the French not to. And sort of therein started months of secret negotiations between Britain and France on what was to actually be done with the Middle East, regardless of what Sharif Hussein was actually promised. And after months of negotiations, they arrived at what's called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, named after the diplomats who negotiated it, Sir Mark Sykes and George Picot. Under Sykes-Picot, Britain got a new colony in eastern Mesopotamia centered around al basra and that's in the bright red. And... Uh, they would gain another puppet state in Northern Arabia and uh, uh, with the capital of Kirkuk, so to the east and north of their colony in Basra. And that's in the pink color. The French also got a colony in Southern Anatolia. You can see it in the dark blue and a puppet state just to the south in the Levant. And it was centered around the city of Mosul. And they really wanted, uh, they really wanted something around Mosul because of the rich oil around the Mosul area. And that was an important aspect of why the French got that area. It was also agreed that Palestine would become an international protectorate. So it would be, be governed internationally. And last but not least, the Kingdom of Arabia, which you saw on the last slide, which was for Sharif Hussein, would now be significantly reduced in territory. Of course, at the time, they didn't actually tell him because they feared that this might end the Arab resistance against the Ottomans. So they told him only after the war was over. He really got played by the Entente there. Now, here's the thing. Contrary to what many people think, the Sykes-Picot agreement was not fully implemented to its desired effect. 
First of all, Russia was all of a sudden experiencing a communist revolution by the Bolsheviks. And soon they were thrown into a bloody civil war. So really there was no point in meeting their needs anymore. And Russia's territorial gains were just completely sidelined. Okay. Second, the Turks, they fought a big war of independence after uh, the World War in order to defend Anatolia and Constantinople. So that took away the territories that Europe was supposed to get inside well, modern day Turkey. Third, the British imperial troops, you know, the troops of the British army, the British empire, they were the ones who actually conquered the, line of, uh, the land of Palestine. The French, the, the French had no troops on the ground in Palestine. And right before the British went into Jerusalem, they issued the Balfour Declaration. So, and that basically, the Balfour Declaration, what it did was it promised to create a so-called Jewish homeland in Palestine. And it would be under the exclusive rule of the British Empire until the Jews could become independent on their own. Of course, that contradicts the agreement that they had with France, which was Palestine to be internationally governed. So in the end, the map didn't look like what was in Sykes-Picot, but it actually looked a little something like this. You see that green, uh, uh, it, looked, it looked a bit, yeah, it looked a bit something like what you see on there. Now you see that green strip uh, of land on the Red Sea there. I wanna show you that part. That was actually now the kingdom that Sharif Hussein ruled over. And it was called the Kingdom of Hejaz. Now, here's, here's the important, here's the interesting part. The British, they actually now began to back someone else in the land of Arabia. His name was Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. And he ruled over what is known as the Sultanate of Najd. And Abdul Aziz fought a war with Hussein and he actually took the Hejaz from him. And he formed the modern day borders of Saudi Arabia. And then Abdul Aziz later went on to establish the current uh, Saudi royal family. Later on, Sharif Hussein, through a series of events, would rule over the area of Transjordan. And he would go on to establish the current royal family of the current kingdom of Jordan. And this basically formed uh, the modern borders of the Middle East, as you can see here. So basically, only the British got what they wanted. They lied to the French, they betrayed the Russians. Most notably, they really betrayed Sharif Hussein, and that really shows, by the way, what you get for collaborating with a bunch of colonizers who just want you want to use you as a political pawn. They don't really care about you. And then, after all that, you see a Palestinian and a Lebanese fighting each other in the comments of some dumb Facebook post, and absolutely mopping the floor with the others with the other country's population. And my answer to that is just. How stupid can you both be? You tell me, what's Iraq? What's Syria? What's Lebanon? What's Egypt? Basically, what happened is you guys were together living happily in, in peace. And then a European guy comes and draws a bunch of lines on the ground between both of you. And now all of a sudden, you convince yourself that you've developed different identities and that you have no problem hating your brother on the other side of the border. I've seen this so many times where, for example... A guy wants to marry this girl, but her dad is wildly refusing because he's saying she has to marry someone from her country or because he's a Muslim, but he's a different Muslim race, even though they're both perfect. And, you know, there could be a high degree of, you know, acceptability, but no, the guy's passport doesn't match my passport. This is pure tribalism. The same thing exactly that existed in Arabia before Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, you know, before Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dominated. And the people there had a huge, you know, rivalry and fanaticism towards their clans. That's why after the Hijrah, after the Prophet immigrated from Mecca to Medina, the first thing the Prophet did was to set an example for us. He, he established a brotherhood between the Muhajireen, who were from Quraysh, who were from Mecca, and the Ansar, who were from the Aws and Khazraj of Medina. فأنزل الله سكينته على رسوله وعلى المؤمنين وألزمهم كلمة التقوى. So if you ever see someone just frantically bragging about his country, whether it be Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Pakistan, I don't care. Ask him first what his conception of that country even means. Back then there was no Egyptian passport or Iraqi passport or Afghan passport or Turkish passport. No, they were all considered regions, geographical regions, and the people living. In those territories, they have more similarities than they have differences. The country that you're super proud of and you, you know, you brag about wherever you go, 
It was most likely drawn on the map by a bunch of European men not too long ago. In fact, the people, there are people in the world currently alive who are much older than your conception of that country. For example, for those of you who are Egyptian, if you remember during the time of Marek Farouk, back when, Egypt, back when Egypt was a kingdom, this was in 1920, when Egypt wasn't just Egypt, it was Egypt, Sudan, and even parts of Palestine. Wallah al -Azim, I know personally, and not people I read about in the news, but I know personally, people in this world right now, if, the, if King Farouk was alive, they would be older than him. The reality is, Islam and nationalism, they're the, you know, almost directly clashing ideals. And they're incompatible. Umar ibn al-Khattab had this famous saying. And honestly, it's the best way to sum it up. Which means, we are a people, we are a nation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has glorified with Islam. And if we seek glory and honor without Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us despicable. Islam, that's it. Glory and honor are through Islam. Not some passport and definitely not by some straight line drawn by the British or the French. Jazakumullah everyone for listening. It was a pleasure presenting to you on the Muslim Du app. Make sure to support it by encouraging your friends and family to download it and make donations to your mosque through the app, inshallah. And uh, I guess I'll see you all next week, inshallah, for another episode, another treasure of history. Assalamu alaikum. الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأسكى التسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين حياكم الله تعالى أحبابنا الكرام في حلقة جديدة مع السادات وحلقتنا اليوم تتكلم عن فتى فتى شاب في مقتبل العمر كان في غاية الذكاء كان يحمل الذكاء الفطري والسليقة العربية الأصيلة فتى من الأعراب ومن بني أشجع وأشجع أحد قبائل غطفان الكبيرة وغطفان فيها بطون كثيرة فأشجع وفزاره وأسلم وسواها كلها تنتمي إليها وهي قبيلة من قبائل قيس عيلان وكان سيد أشجع كلها هو مسعود بن رخيلة الأشجعي وأما سيد غطفان الذي فوقه فهو عيينة ابن حصن ابن حذيفة بن بدر الفزاري الغطفاني وكانت بلاد أشجع دولة كاملة ممتدة الأطراف وهي عبارة عن بلد للأعراب يعني للبادية كانت تتحرك فيه غطفان في ديارها من قرية صغيرة إلى قرية صغيرة ومن هجرة إلى هجرة ومن بادية إلى بادية يعني هي في مساحة كبيرة جدا تشمل أجزاء من بادية المدينة المنورة حولها إلى ما حول خيبر ممتدا بعد ذلك باتجاه نجد وتستمر حتى تصل إلى حدود بني أسد وكانت هذه أرضا متسعة الأطراف مترامية المساحة شاسعة واسعة والصحابي الذي سوف نتكلم عنه اليوم هو سيدنا نعيم بن مسعود الأشجعي الغطفاني وهو شاب في مقتبل العمر نشأ وقد سمع بدعوة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل إسلامه فأعرض عنها لأنه كان شابا يحب الترحال ويحب شهوات الدنيا كان مشغولا بأمور له من شرب خمر وسماع قينات ونساء وسوى ذلك وكان كثيرا ما يذهب إلى يثرب إلى يثرب المدينة قبل الهجرة ويأوي إلى قريظة وكان سيد قريظة في ذلك الوقت يدعى كعب بن أسد القرظي يوصف بأن وجهه جميل كالمرآة وكان صديقا له فكان يدخل عليه فإذا دخل عليه استأذن ثم قال له كعب بن أسد مرحبا وأهلا فيضع له من طعامهم وكان من خيرة طعامهم ما يسمى بالحيسة أو الحيس ما هو الحيس؟ هو تمر يصنع من تمر العجوة أو تمر الحلوة أو تمر الروتانة أو سواها تمر يفت وبعد ذلك يوضع معه شيء من الأقط ما هو الأقط؟ 
القط القط هو الجميد اللبن الذي يملح ويجف حتى يصبح أقراصا أقراصا كتلا عالي جدا في قيمته الغذائية ومليء بالمكملات وبالمعادن وسواها وكانت العرب عندما تملحه وتجففه يخزن فترة طويلة الأقط أو الجميد يصنع منه الآن الأكلة الشهيرة التي تعمل في بلاد الشام أكلة المنسف التي توضع أقراص الجميد فيها ويصنع منها الشراب مع السمن ويوضع على اللحم والأرز ويكون في غاية الحسن والجودة والطعم الطيب فكان هذا الطعام يوضع تمر مفتوت مخلوط بالأقط ثم يوضع معه سويق وشعير أحيانا سمن أحيانا عسل أحيانا سمسم أو حبة حبة البركة الحبة السوداء وتخلط كلها ثم تقدم وهو من أنفس الطعام وأطيبه فكان كعب بن أسد يضع له الحيسة ويقول له تفضل ويضع له الخمر شرابا وتأتي القينات المغنيات فيغنين فيجلس نعيم بن مسعود ويسمع وكان طعام العرب في جاهليتهم طعاما قاسيا فهم يأكلون اللحم وأحيانا يأكلون معه الثريد إذا أغنوا إذا كان عندهم غنوة وأما إذا قحطوا وصارت الأمور عندهم في محل وشدة فإنهم كانوا يأكلون العلهز ما هو العلهز؟ العلهز هو جلد الجمل يعني وبره يطبخ مع دمه بعد أن يؤكل اللحم ولا يبقى منه شيء لأن إنهم في فترة ضيق وشدة فكانوا يخلطون الوبر مع الدم فيسمى هذا طعام العلهز هذا طعام الجهد أو يأكلون الرمم ما هي الرمة؟ هي الميتة التي عفنت وتغير حالها أنتنت فكانت تؤكل مع القحط ومع شدة السغب يعني عندما لا يكون هناك طعام في المجاعات فالآن عندما يأتي فيأكل الحيسة هذا طعام فاخر بالنسبة للعلهز والرمم طبعا ليس كل طعامهم علهز ورمم إنما أتكلم في حال القحط ثم كان كعب بن أسد يحمل بعد ذلك جمل نعيم بن مسعود الأشجعي بالكثير من التمر حتى لا يطيق بعد ذلك أن يحمل أكثر ثم يسيره ويشيعه إلى أهله فكان هذا تعامل صحبة نعيم بن مسعود الأشجعي مع كعب بن أسد القرضي وأيضا نعيم بن مسعود أعرض عن الدعوة الإسلامية في بدء أمرها حتى هاجر النبي صلى الله الله عليه وسلم ووقعت موقعة الفرقان يوم بدر ثم بعدها غزوة أحد وفي غزوة أحد يذكر لنعيم بن مسعود موقف أثناء شركه قبل أن يسلم عندما التقى أبا سفيان بعد أن انسحبت قريش من أحد وعادت أدراجها لا تلوي على شيء وكان القرشيون يقولون لا محمدا قتلتم ولا الكواعب أردفتم بئس ما صنعتم يعني لا أنكم قتلتم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا قتلتم صحابته كلهم ولا استحللتم المدينة ولا أخذتم نساءها سبيات ولا أخذتم الذرار بعد فأي شيء صنعتم بئس ما صنعتم هكذا كانوا يقولون في هذا الوقت وبعد أن خرجت قريش من حياض المدينة المنورة وسارت بضعا وخمسين كيلا واقتربت من فج الروحاء ووادي سج, وادي سج سج وهو من وديان الجنة كما أخبر صلى الله عليه وسلم لقي أبا سفيان نعيما بن مس ابن مسعود الأشجعي فطلب إليه أن يقول يعني طلب أبو سفيان طلب أبو سفيان من نعيم بن مسعود أن يضع قولا يقول فيه أن قريشا عزمت على أن تكر مرة أخرى إلى المدينة لتأكل المسلمين أكلا وتقضي على الإسلام في مهده وأنه سيأتيها مدد وسوف ترجع مرة أخرى للقضاء على الإسلام والمسلمين فقال نعيم بن مسعود كم تجعل لي إن قلت بذلك قال أجعل لك عشر جمال عشر نياق عندئذ قال أفعل فعاد وقال لأهل المدينة من المسلمين إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فاخشوهم يعني قريش جمعت لكم وأوعبت والمدد لها قادم وهم قد عزموا أن يأتوا ليخلصوا عليكم بعد أن قتلوا سيدنا حمزة وقتلوا سبعين شهيدا من المسلمين الآن يريدون استئصالكم ويريدون بتر شأفة الإسلام فنزل قول الله تعالى الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فاخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسب حسبنا الله هو نعم الوكيل فانقلبوا بنعمة من الله وفضل لم يمسسهم سوء واتبعوا رضوان الله والله ذو فضل عظيم إنما ذلكم الشيطان يخوف أولياءه فلا تخافوهم وخافون إن كنتم مؤمنين 
سبحان الله العظيم فعند إذن قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم والله لا أجاهدنهم ولو خرجت وحدي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم فنهج الله للمسلمين بصائرهم وأقام لهم فكرهم وقاموا مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فخاف المشركون بزيادة لما وصلتهم أخبار استعداد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وإلى حمراء الأسد لم يأتي إلا أبو عزة الشاعر الذي كان قد أسره النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في بدر وأخذ عليه العهود والمواثيق إن هو من عليه ألا يكافر عليه ولا يجمع عليه لكنه بعد ذلك نقض عهده وخان وأراد تجميع قريش في حمراء الأسد بعد غزوة أحد على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فماذا كانت النتيجة؟ أتى بعد ذلك بعد أن أسره المسلمون ولم يكن إلا هو قد جاء إلى حمراء الأسد وفرت قريش كلها خوفا من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فجاء إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يستعطفه ببناته ويقول يا محمد أطلقني ما تفعل بنياتي من بعدي قال لا والله لا أدعك تمسح عارضيك تقول خدعت محمدا مرتين ولا يلدغ المؤمن من جحر مرتين يا زبير اضرب عنقه فمات أبو عزة الشاعر بخيانته تلك وعندها نزل في نعيم بن مسعود قول الله تعالى الذين قال لهم الناس يعني نعيم بن مسعود إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فاخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ثم بعد ذلك بعد غزوة أحد وقعت غزوة بني النضير حيث أجلي بني أجلي بني النضير لخيانتهم ومحاولتهم اغتيال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بأن يرموا عليه حجر رحى ليشدخوا بها رأسه الشريف صلى الله عليه وسلم فانتهى الأمر بجلائهم من المدينة وذهابهم إلى خيبر ونزول أهل خيبر عليهم وكان الذي تولى الخيانة العظمى حيي بن أخطب النضري المسمى بالمشؤوم الذي شأم قومه بني النضير وأدى إلى جلائهم عن المدينة المنورة وذهابهم إلى خيبر فلما وصلوا إلى خيبر لم يلبثوا أن جمعوا جمعا قيل أربعين من أهل خيبر وقيل سبعين وذهبوا إلى أهل مكة إلى أبي سفيان بن حرب بن أمية يستنصرونه في حرب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعندئذ قابل أبو سفيان قابل هذا الوفد بقيادة حيي بن أخطب ومن معه من آل أبي الحقيق الربيع بن أبي الحقيق الذي كان عنده ثلاثة من البنين الربيع بن الربيع وكنانة بن الربيع وأظنه كان في الوفد أيضا وأبو رافع سلام بن أبي الحقيق فهؤلاء الثلاثة كان لهم دور كبير في حرب الإسلام شهد منهم هذا الوفد كنانة ابن الربيع ابن أبي الحقيق شهده مع حيي ابن أخطب وأقسم الجميع على حرب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فأخرجوا قدرا أخرجت قريش قدرا كبيرا كبيرة مليئة دما ثم غمسوا أيديهم فيها ودهنوا رؤوسهم وصدورهم ثم وضعوا أيديهم ورؤوسهم وصدورهم على الكعبة يعني السبعون من خيبر وسبعون واحدا من قريش قالت لهم قالت لهم يهود أخرجوا لنا سبعين من قريشا نتعاهد على حرب محمد وأقسموا أن يجمعوا على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ويكافروا عليه ويقاتلوا فخرجت من قريش ألفا ألف ألفا مقاتل وخرجت من أحابيش قريش ألفان آخرا خرج من أحابيش قريش ألفان آخرا فكانت قريش وأحابيشها أربعة آلاف مقاتل ثم سعت بعد ذلك سعى الوفد من خيبر إلى غطفان فخرج من غطفان من قبائلها المختلفة وخرج من بني سليم وخرج من بني أسد بقيادة طليحة بن ابن خويلد الأسدي الذي ادعى النبوة بعد ذلك ثم كسر وآب للإسلام واستشهد في معركة القادسية خرج منهم ستة آلاف مقاتل فاكتمل جمع الأحزاب عشرة آلاف مقاتل وتوجهوا إلى المدينة فواجههم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بفكرة سيدنا سلمان الفارسي باحتفال الخندق الذي حفر في ستة أيام وقيل في اثني عشر يوما وكان طوله زهاء ألفان وسبعمائة متر يعني كيلوين وسبعمائة متر وعمقه ثلاث إلى أربع أمتار وعرضه ثلاث إلى أربع أمتار والتراب الذي يؤخذ من حفره كان يوضع جهة المسلمين ليتترسوا به وكانت له أبواب وأخذ من جبل سلع حجارة صفت كالعناقيد كالضفائر ليستخدمها المسلمون في رمي كل من يقترب من الخندق أو يقع فيه واستخدمت أيضا المعالم الطبيعية من الجبال كجبل بني عبيد وكجبل الراية واستفيد من جبل سلع في مسجد الفتح الأعلى حيث ضربت قبة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من أدم على هذا الجبل وكانت قبل ذلك على جبل الراية أثناء حفر 
في الخندق واحتفر الخندق من عند أطم الشيخين أو أجم الشيخين من ذلك الموضع مرورا براتج وديار بني عبد الأشهل بني زعورة من بني عبد الأشهل ثم بعد ذلك تنصف بجبل الراية أو جبل ذباب حيث كانت قبة, قبة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أثناء الحفر ومضى بعد ذلك الخندق سائرا إلى أن وصل إلى جبل بني عبيد الكبير ومن ثم إلى أطم المذاد حيث انتهى هناك ليسد ما بين الحرة الشرقية حرة واقم والحرة الغربية حرة الوبرة ويكون مانعا طبيعيا لدخول قريش من هذا المكان المفتوح وأما في جهة الشرق وادي مهزور فكانت حصون قريضة وكان هناك عهد بين النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقريضة يمنع دخول الأحزاب إلى تلك النواحي وقد كانت قريش قريضة أعطت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأعارته المساحي والمكاتل التي احتفر بها الخندق يعني كانوا ماضين على عهدهم لا يريدون الخيانة فيما يظهر للمؤمنين وبعد ذلك أيها السادة الكرام جاءت قريش بقدها وقديدها ونزلت في وادي العقيق ونزلت غطفان في زغابة بمجمع الأسيال من طرف النقمة وادي نقمي وعندئذ تكامل الحشد عشرة آلاف مقاتل حصروا المدينة قيل خمس عشرة ليلة وقيل عشرين ليلة وكان الصحابة رضي الله عنهم يقومون على الخندق على طوله ثلاثة آلاف مقاتل من الصحابة ألف وخمسمائة منهم حفروا الخندق وألف كانوا في عمل دائم قسم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الخندق بين المهاجرين والأنصار من أطم الشيخين إلى جبل الراية كان للمهاجرين ومن جبل الراية ذباب إلى أطم المذاد كان للأنصار وقسم كل عشرة من الصحابة ليحتفروا عشرة أذرع طولا وعرضا وعمقا فيسيروا فيها ويحتفروها ثلاث إلى أربع أمتار عمقا وثلاث إلى أربع أمتار عرضا وعشرة أذرع طولا فساروا فيها واحتفروا فروها في فترة قياسية ومد بعد ذلك الخندق من جهة بني دينار ومن جهة أيضا بني حارثة فكان عفوا بني سلمة فكان هنالك امتدادات أيضا للخندق في بعض الروايات ليصل إلى أكثر من خمسة عشر ألف ذراع أو إثنى عشر ألف ذراع وكان هذا عملا جبارا وكان يقوم فيه سيدنا سلمان الذي كان يحتفر عن عشرة رضي الله عنه وأرضاه واختلف في رغبة الحصول عليه بين المهاجرين والأنصار فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما في الروايات الضعيفة سلمان منا أهل البيت بعد أن تكامل وصول الأحزاب كان حيي بن أخطب مع أبي سفيان الذي استلم القيادة العامة لقريش وغطفان وأما قيادة غطفان فكانت في عيين بن حصن بن حذيفة بن بدر الفزاري الغطفاني وتحته الحارث بن عوف ومسعود بن رخيلة وطليحة بن خويلد الأسدي في بني أسد وبعد ذلك بدأ الحصار وكان أيضا المسلمون يتعرضون لهجمات شديدة جدا وكان خالد بن الوليد لما يسلم بعد كان يقود الهجمات بشكل شرس وفي يوم هجم خمسة أو ستة من فرسان من كبار فرسان المشركين وقطعوا مكانا ضيقا في الخندق فقفزت منه خيولهم منهم عمرو بن عبد ودن العامري الذي أثبت في بدر وعجز عن الخروج في القتال بأحد فأقسم ألا يدهن بدهن حتى يقاتل المسلمين في الخندق وقتله سيدنا علي عليه السلام وخرج كذلك قطع الخندق هبيرة بن أبي هبيرة وقطعه عكرمة بن أبي جهل ابن عمرو بن هشام بن المغيرة المخزومي هؤلاء جميعا قطعوا الخندق وانتهى الأمر بقتل عمرو بن عبد ود وهروب بقية المشركين ووقوع بعض سلاحهم منهم وغنيمته للمسلمين ثم بعد ذلك أيها السادة الكرام استمر حصار الخندق هذه المدة كلها وهجم المشركون هجوما شاملا على الخندق ورأى خالد بن الوليد مع الفرقة المتقدمة التي معه أنه يجب أن يستهدف قبة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالرمي على مسجد الفسح الأعلى المسجد الفتح الذي كان على جبل سلع ليس مسجد الفسح بل هو مسجد الفتح كما تقدم فجعلوا يرمونه بالسهام وكان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يحرس في قبته وكان دائما يحرسه عباد بن بشر الأشهر رضي الله عنه الذي استشهد في موقعة اليمامة وفي مرة هجم المشركون هجوما شاملا مما جعل المسلمين لا يستطيعون أن يصلوا للظهر ولا العصر ولا المغرب ولا العشاء ومعه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في شغل شديد يضربون من جهة إلى جهة في الخندق وفي هذه الأثناء قال أبو سفيان لحوي بن أخطب ما بال قريضة قومك ألا ينصروننا قال إنهم معك بل ينصروننا وأنا أذهب إلى كعب بن أسد وأقنعه بأن يكون معنا انظر هنا بدأت الخيانة 
فذهب إلى كعب بن أسد فلقي غزال بن شمويل فقال له جئتك ببحر طام وعدد هائل من العرب ليقتلوا محمدا وإنا منصورون في فورتنا هذه قال ما جئتنا إلا بالخذلان واذهب إلى كعب بن أسد كعب بن أسد لم يكن يريد أن يرى حيي بن أخطب النضري لأنه كان معروفا بأنه مشؤوم قد شأم قومه وشأم الكثيرين قبلهم فطلب ألا يخرج إليه فجعل يناديه من وراء الباب جئتك ببحر طام وجئتك بقريش وقدها وقديدها وبغطفان وقبائلها وجئتك يركبون الجمال والفرسان ويقاتلون بالسيوف والرماح والأسهم وجئتك بنصر عاجل وبفورة تذهب المسلمين وتطفئ نورهم قال جئتني بسحاب ليس فيه مطر وببرق ورعد لا لا طائل من ورائهما قال فافتح لي أكلمك قال لا أفتح لك قال إنما ظننت علي بألا آكل معك من جشيشتك يعني من طعام عشائك فأحفظه وأحرجه ففتح له فجعل يفتله في في الذهاب والعودة جعل يفتر رأيه ويأخذه في الغارب والعودة منه حتى فتنه عن رأيه وأقنعه بأن يخون النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعل يكلمه أنك إن خفت أن تفرد إذا هزم محمد على فرض أنه هزم وعادت قريش وغطفان إلى ديارهما فإننا نأخذ رهنا من قريش سبعين من أشرافها يكونون عندنا محبوسين حتى نضمن ألا تنسحب قريش وغطفان وكان من قبل قال لأبي سفيان مثل ذلك قال نأخذ رهنا أو رهنا من قريضة نجعله معنا إن خشينا انسحابهم حتى نضمن بقائهم على ولائهم في حربنا انظر ماذا فعل هذا الرجل المشؤوم فأخرج كعب بن أسد كتاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي فيه أنه لا تعينوني على لا تكافر علي عدوا يدهم المدينة ولا تعينوا من يحاربني فوق فمزق الكتاب وقطعه وأعلن أنه خان رسول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وظهرت خيانة قريضة وعندئذ ماج البحر الطامي بالمسلمين وبلغت القلوب الحناجر وخرجت دوريات الباترولز من قريضة تسيح في المدينة تبحث في الآطام بين النساء والأطفال عن ثغرة تقتل النساء وتفتح وتهتك بقيادة النباش بن قيس القرظي الذي قال يد الله مغلولة غلت أيديهم ولعنوا بما قالوا بل يداه مبسوطتان ينفق كيف يشاء ولا يزيدن كثيرا منهم ما أنزل إليك من ربك طغيانا وكفرا والدوريات الثانية كانت أيضا بقيادة غزال بن صموئيل أو شمويل وأما عند إذن عندما سمع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بذلك قال إني أرجو الله أن أفتح مكة وأن أستلم الحجر الأسود وأن أطوف بالبيت العتيق وأن يغنمكم الله كنوز كسرى وقيصر فقام معتب بن قشير وقال هذا يعدنا بكنوز كسرى وقيصر وأحدنا لا يأمن يقوم يقضي حاجته ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا وهنا أنزل الله قوله تعالى وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارُ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرَ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ هُنَالِكَ ابْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا ويستأذن طائفة منهم النبي أوس بن قيضي الحارث من بني حارثة الأوس يقولون إن بيوتنا عورة وما هي بعورة إن يريدون إلا فرارا ولو دخلت عليهم من أقطارها ثم سئلوا الفتنة لأتوها وما تلبثوا بها إلا يسيرا ولقد كانوا عاهدوا الله من قبل لا يولون الأدبار وكان عهد الله مسؤولا قل لن ينفعكم الفرار إن فررتم من الموت أو القتل وإذا لا تمتعون إلا قليلا قل من ذا الذي يعصمكم من الله إن أراد بكم سوءا أو أراد بكم رحمة ولا يجدون لهم من دون الله وليا ولا نصيرا آيات عظيمة عجيبة شديدة في هذه الأثناء ينظر نعيم بن مسعود الفتى ينظر الذي كان في خيل أشجع مع مسعود بن رخيل تحت غطفان عين بن حصن الفزاري ينظر إلى استبسال المسلمين في القتال وينظر إلى نفسه لماذا أقاتل على ماذا أقاتل غطفان تريد تمر المدينة تريد أن تحصل على التمر وتريد أن تذل العرب وتريد أن تذل الأوس والخزرج طب أنا الآن إذا قتلت على أي مبدأ أقاتل وما هذا الاستبسال العظيم من المسلمين في دفاعهم عن نبيهم وعن دينهم لا والله بل لأكونن على الحق فذهب ليلا دون أن يعرف قومه فأسلم بين يدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال يا رسول الله ما أصنع لك كيف تريدني أن أفرق الأحزاب قال إنما أنت رجل واحد لكن خذل عنا ما استطعت قال يا رسول الله إئذن لي أن أقول يعني أن أكذب قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قل ما بدالك الحرب خدعة أو خدعة أو خدعة 
يعني أن الحرب فيها تاكتكس فيها استراتيجيات في العمل العسكري فعند إذن ذهب نعيم بن مسعود فدخل على كعب بن أسد القرظي صديقه القديم السلام عليكم أصدقائي عدت إليكم من جديد وحلقة جديدة من برنامجنا قصص للأطفال معي اليوم قصة جديدة من مكتبة الياسمين ولكن قبل أن أقرأ لكم القصة هل تعلمون الخبز الذي نأكله كل يوم مما, مص... مما صنع؟ من الطحين أو الدقيق صحيح ولكن من أين يأتي هذا الطحين؟ وما هي قصته؟ وكيف ينمو؟ وهل هو مزروع؟ أم هل هو من اللحم؟ أم من أين نأخذه؟ أنتم تعلمون أن الله تعالى يخلق كل شيء من عدم من لا شيء أما الإنسان فيصنع الأشياء التي خلقها الله له فالله يخلق لنا المواد الأولية ثم نحن نصنع منها الأشياء كما مثلا الكرسي الذي نجلس عليه هو مصنوع من خشب الإنسان صنعه ولكن من خلق له المواد الأولية؟ من خلق الخشب؟ ومن أين نأتي بها؟ أحسنتم الخشب يأتي من الشجر الذي خلقه الله تعالى لنا ماذا عن الخبز؟ يا ترى من أين يأتي الخبز؟ ومن أين يأتي الدقيق؟ الطحين الذي نصنع منه الخبز؟ هيا الآن ستعرفون من أين يأتي الخبز وماذا خلق الله لنا لكي نستعين به لصناعة الخبز قصتنا اليوم اسمها مشوار قمحة القمح هو المادة الأساسية التي نصنع منها الخبز الذي نأكله كل يوم واليوم سوف نعرف كيف تكون القمحة منذ زراعتها حتى نقطفها قصتنا لليوم تأليف زينب قانصو ورسوم هيام صفوت هيا معا لنتعرف عليها حبة قمح تحت التراب فإذا في البداية يزرع المزارع الحبة تحت التراب ثم ماذا يحدث يا ترى؟ تمتص الماء وتنتفخ ربما يهتل المطر أو يسقيها المزارع فتشرب الماء وتنتفخ الحبة ثم ماذا يا ترى؟ ثم تمتد جذور رفيعة انظروا كم هي رفيعة تحت التراب ثم ماذا؟ وخرجت ساق خضراء انظروا ها هي الساق تمتد لتخرج خارجا وتكون خضراء خضراء ولكن الخبز أبيض هيا لنرى ماذا يحدث بعد ذلك تكبر الساق تحت أشعة الشمس انظروا إليها تنمو وتنمو وتطول ثم ماذا؟ تظهر أوراق طويلة so long. أوراق طويلة 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 من هنا انظروا إلى الجذور ثم ماذا؟ ثم تظهر سنبلة صغيرة انظروا ها هي السنبلة الصغيرة فيها ساق وأوراق وأزهار يكون على السنبلة ها هنا أزهار ثم ماذا؟ ثم تظهر سنبلة كبيرة فيها ساق وأوراق وحبات قمح انظروا إلى حبات القمح الخضراء كم هي جميلة ثم ماذا؟ ثم تصبح سنبلة خضراء طرية لينة سوفت تحمل حبوب قمح صغيرة ثم ماذا؟ هل نستطيع أن نقطفها في هذا الوقت ونصنع منها خبزا؟ ليس بعد ثم تصبح سنبلة صفراء صلبة سنبلة 
صفراء صلبة هل ماتت هكذا يا ترى؟ أم هي جاهزة لكي يقطفها المزارع ويجنيها؟ هيا لنرى وهذه السنابل تحمل حبوب قمح كبيرة كبيرة يحصد المزارع السنابل الصفراء بآلة كبيرة ها هو المزارع وها هي السنابل الصفراء انظروا كم هي طويلة تبدو بطوله تقريبا هيا معا لنرى آلته ها هي الآلة التي تقطع السنابل الصفراء الطويلة انظروا إليها ثم تفصل حبوب القمح عن القشرة انظروا وتصبح هكذا بعد أن تكون سنبلة كلها مع بعض تفرط وتسحب القشرة وتصبح حبوب بهذا الشكل ثم تذهب إلى المصانع لكي يصنعوا منها الخبز اللذيذ والكثير الكثير من المأكولات الشهية والمفيدة سبحان الله انظروا بذرة ثم جذور تنتفخ ثم جذور رفيعة ثم ساق أخضر صغيرة ثم ساق طويلة ثم أعشاب كثيرة ثم سنابل مع زهور ثم سنبلة خضراء طرية ثم سنبلة خضراء يابسة ثم سنبلة صفراء قاسية لها حبوب كبيرة فحصاد ثم تذهب إلى المصانع وتعد خبزا لذيذا نستمتع بأكله كلنا يم يم فإذا ما رأيكم أن تخبروا ماما وبابا عن ما هي قصة مشوار القمحة؟ كيف تكون في البداية وإلى ما تتحول؟ إن حفظتم الخطوات أرسلوها لنا على قناة مسلم دو وأخبروا ماما وبابا عن الخطوات وسأراكم إن شاء الله في قصص رائعة في حلقاتنا الأسبوع القادم في الساعة الثامنة من يوم الجمعة انتظرونا إلى اللقاء السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters Welcome back to another session on steps to how we can understand the Quran Alhamdulillah it's been many lessons in which we have uh, guided ourselves as to how we're supposed to approach the Quran what type of a mindset we're supposed to have what our objective is what the methodology is going to look like and today we're going to be closing off with another important point, inshallah, that will pretty much conclude the session on this particular theme. And what we want to focus on in today's lesson is the concept of abrogation. What happens is if a person is not going to understand some of the... Um, the, the nature of how the Qur'an was revealed, then when they're going to read it without the understanding, they definitely are going to come across areas and passages that will leave them, that will leave them confused simply because they are going to perceive a contradiction. And in essence, it's really not a contradiction. It's more of a timeline as to what was being instructed at one point versus what was being instructed at another point. So the first thing I wanted to, uh, us to understand is that there is the concept of abrogation applied in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the Qur'an is saying, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in Surah Al-Baqarah that whatever verse, okay, whatever verse we are going to abrogate. Now, for those of us who would like to, to have the reference, this is verse number 106. So he's telling us that whatever verse we are going to abrogate or we are going to cause for it to be forgotten. Right? So nun siha, 
then we will bring something better than it or something of its like. Oh, mithliha. And are you not aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of all things? So this is verse number 106 in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now informing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Ummah that there are verses in this Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to cancel and replace with something that's going to be better or that's going to be similar. And the hikmah behind that is confined to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have to understand that there was that developmental stage for the Muslims during the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life as a prophet where they were going from one stage of life to another stage of life and working towards the ultimate goal, which was the completion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bounty on this ummah, where he says, That I have completed my bounty upon you. And I am pleased with Islam as a deen, a way of life, a system for you. Now, in order to get to that phase, there are going to be milestones and there's going to be development within the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. There's going to be the weaning off of certain habits, replacing them with other habits, taking them from one standard of life to another standard of life, which means that certain instructions are going to be applied in one phase and then when the objective is met, it will be then replaced with another set of instructions that will take him to the next phase and the next milestone. So you have to understand that this is the nature of the Quran. It was being revealed in installments. It's a book that was guiding uh, the Prophet wasallam and his companions through those different phases. And as a result, changes in instructions are only going to be natural. It's no different that when than when you're going to have a coach, whether it's going to be for physical training, whether it's going to be for dieting, whatever you may have a coach for. You all understand that in the beginning stages, there's going to be certain instructions that will be issued to an individual to begin their development. And as they are they're slowly progressing those instructions are going to be replaced with other instructions in order for them to continue the progress so understand that that's the nature of the quran now it's interesting that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that are you not aware that allah is capable of all things because here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indirectly is contesting the uh the the yahudi uh notion Okay, the, the notion that was held by the community uh, of, or I should say the Jewish community in the time of Rasulullah and beyond, that the concept of abrogation does not exist within scripture because it is indicative of Allah being flawed. Allah is beyond flaws and therefore there can be no abrogation. So that in itself is a notion that was held by them which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pretty much contesting simply because who is, who is a human to come and impose boundaries and parameters on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says he's capable of doing all things. So this is the one thing that we have to be aware of, that this concept exists. Now it's going to be our responsibility to connect with a scholar of the Quran to become aware of those areas in order for us to not fall under any form of confusion uh, when we are coming across these passages when we're in our readings. Uh, today, inshallah, I'm going to give you a few examples of what abrogation looks like. Right. So there's a, a couple that I wanted to share in Surah Al-Baqarah. So say, for example, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about inheritance. So you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, verse number 180, there you're going to find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, khayra al lil wal bil -ma'ruf. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now ordaining upon all of us, kutiba alaykum, upon all of you, that when death is going to make itself present to any one of you, if you have left any wealth, then you are required to make a bequest. 
right? And who's this bequest for? Parents and close relatives in goodness, bil ma'aruf. And this is an obligation on those who are God conscious. Haqqana ala al muttaqin. So now what you have here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has issued instructions in Surah Al Baqarah that prior to a person passing away, they are going to have to make a bequest that certain, their assets, their estate is going to be distributed amongst these people. Al Walidain, the parents, if they are alive, and Aqrabin, close relatives, which would now be inclusive of siblings, children, and uh, uh, close, uh, you know, uncles and aunts and cousins and so forth. This is basically going to be aqrabin, and then Allah keeps it open bil ma'aruf in goodness. I right? try and be as fair as you can. You can see that it's pretty much left to the discretion of the individual that is about to pass, right? So as long as they have good intentions, they try and do things as fairly as they can. And this is an obligation that they will have fulfilled. Now, that is going to be an earlier instruction that is issued to the believers. But then all of that is going to be abrogated by the verses in Surah Nisa. And uh, in Surah Nisa, which is chapter number four, you are going to see from verse 11 onwards where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now actually designating the portions which are going to be directed at each heir. Okay, so this heir is going to get this much, this heir is going to get that much. All of that is now being designated, made it easy for the uh, individual. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, interestingly, your, your parents, your children, you don't know which one of them is closer to you in terms of benefit. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gone ahead and saved you uh, from any form of confusion, bewilderment, and has designated the portions for you. So now when you're going to make a will, it will be in light of these instructions that Allah has issued in Surah to nisa verse number 11 onwards. So here's an example of something that was now left in the beginning open and left to one's discretion because Apparently, it wasn't something that was typically exercised and typically uh, resorted to at the time of death, right? So this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now prepared the grounds for when it comes to the believers to start doing this, incorporate this within your practices. And then once that has now, they've settled into this new practice of a sort, now Allah takes them to the next level. Well, now it's not going to be left to your discretion anymore. Now these portions are des designated and you're just going to have to follow through. So you can see the development phase there, going from one phase to another phase. Right? First incorporate the practice and then after the incorporation, and then comes the designation. Right? And so this is just one example. Another example is the example in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, you can see verse number 240 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the waiting period for widows. Well, here you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular verse is uh, saying that they are going to be required to uh, pretty much, um, well, I'm, I'm think, uh, actually mixing this up. So before I want to go to verse number 240, I actually wanted to cover verse number 234. And in 234 there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the waiting period for the widows is going to be four months and ten days. They're going to withhold themselves for a period of four months and ten days. right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about when they reach the end of that period, what they're going to do and so forth. But here he's made it very clear. In verse number 234, that when a person, when a woman is going to lose her husband, she is required to undergo a waiting period of four months and 10 days. But then just several verses after in verse number 240, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these widows are going to have to wait for a waiting period of one whole year. Right? It says, Mata'ani Okay, so what 
وصيه لازواجه متاعا الى حول غير اخراج فان خرجنا فلا جنا عليكم فيما فعلنا في انفسهن بالمعروف so there allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pretty much saying that there's going to be a bequest made for the uh, the spouses the widows in this case by the husbands prior to their passing that they are going to be taken care of they're going to be given all of their uh everyday supplies everyday living supplies for an entire year without being expelled from the house okay in al hawli ghayr ikhraj fa in kharajna fala jana alaykum so basically what you have here is that the waiting period for a woman is now one year so now you're seeing a contradiction here is a woman supposed to stay for 4 months and 10 days or is a woman now going to stay for one year which one is it and here you when we are going to go back to the sources the hadith sources and so forth it will become clear that this that we see in verse number 240 is the first phase of the waiting period where there was already a one year waiting period that was already exercised by uh the arabs during that time although they had other practices uh associated with that waiting period that was all put aside and here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has basically made a modification to that one year period where now they're going to be taken care of rather put put in isolation where they're not going to bathe and and groom themselves and so forth which was one of the things that the arabs are doing in the pre-islamic era so it was that one year that was sanctioned okay with slight modifications to the culture and then that was replaced by 4 months and 10 days going forward but now when it comes to the sequence of the verses remember the verses are not are uh, as when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is being dictated by jibril alayhi salatu wasallam as to how the, to place these verses they're not necessarily going to be in sequence of revelation okay one verse will be placed here another verse will be placed elsewhere which is not going to be in the order that it was revealed that's another thing that you need to understand about the quran Okay so these are certain technicalities which will help you navigate through the Quran as you read through it that when it comes to sequence of revelation that's not necessarily followed through in the compilation of these uh, surahs in uh, these verses within the surah because the compilation is through divine dictation from Allah to Jibril alayhi salat to some to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam which would be solidified every ramadan when there would be a reading going on between the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and jibril alayhi salat wasallam for everything that was revealed till that date okay or till that time so here's another example now if a person didn't know these this little background and the concept of uh, abrogation then yes they would see contradiction and get confused so here is that's another example uh another example that i want to finish off with because um i've just been told that i've got 1 minute left is you see in surah al-ahzab okay where in surah al-ahzab uh, which is chapter number 33 verse number 50 there you will find the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being told that he is permitted to go ahead and marry whichever woman he likes as long as he is going to give the marital gift إن أحلنا لك أزواجك التي آتيت أجورهن. Okay, and then there's a it's a lengthy verse that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is going to point out which type of uh, which type of women he's allowed to marry, whether it's going to be بنات عمك وبنات عماتك وبنات خالك وبنات خالك خالاتك. So whether it's going to be the daughters of his paternal uncles or maternal uh, or paternal aunts or maternal uncles or maternal aunts. whether it's going to be women that are want to uh, give them themselves over in marriage to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you can read through all of this at the end this is pretty much left open to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he can go ahead and get married without any restrictions that are being imposed in terms of numbers you find that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that very same verse is saying qad alimna ma faradna alayhim fi azwajihim we know what we have obligated upon them in respect to their spouses this is in terms of the limit being put to four for regular believers right being in this polygynous type of environment where they had no limits allah had put a limit of four uh, on the believers 
And here, when it comes to the Prophet ﷺ, that limit is not applicable. And Allah saying, we know what has been applied there. But that is not going to be applied to you because Khali meaning this is exclusive to you. It's not going to be extended to the believers. So here you have one verse. Now going forward, just uh, verse number 52, there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that after these women that you have, no women are halal for you. Nor can you exchange wives that where you can divorce one and marry another in her place. You can't do that. So now apparently we're going to ask ourselves, okay, so the Prophet is does he have restrictions or does he not have restrictions? Which verse is going to be applicable to him? And again, going back into the tafsir sources and to the hadith sources, you will see that first Allah had imposed a restriction on the Prophet ﷺ in verse number 52, but then that, uh, that restriction was uplifted later and replaced by verse number 50. Okay, so again, and you can also see that the verses are not arranged in terms of sequence of revelation. Okay, so this is the way it was divinely dictated to the Prophet ﷺ, but by knowing this background and understanding the concept of abrogation, it's easier for us to understand and navigate. So that's something I'm going to ask you to hook up with your local Quran scholar with. Hopefully these sessions have been beneficial in which we can now have a better understanding as to how to approach the Quran. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he connects each and every single one of us with the Quran and makes us uh, keep or keeps us attached with it until we breathe our last Jazakallah khayr, subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdi, kana shadu wa la ilaha ila ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.